May the reception of this sacrament, O Lord our God, and the profession of our faith in the eternal trinity and undivided unity befit us for the salvation of body and soul. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. These words, dear brethren, come from today's post-communion prayer for the Mass of the Holy Trinity, the great feast that we celebrate today. And along with this feast of the Holy Trinity, of course, it's also Father's Day, and I'd like to wish all of the fathers here a very happy Father's Day. But with Father's Day, and also united with the Feast of the Holy Trinity, of whom God the Father is certainly a part of, I want to preach to you a little bit about fathers and the duties of fathers. Of course, what always is, is spoken of is the temporal duties of a father, and we're, of course, not minimizing this in any way, shape, or form. We know the temporal duties of a father to, to care for the, 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 all the needs of the family, to, to, to make the, the money for the family, and to put a roof over their head, and clothes on their back, and food on their table, and to care for all of those, those temporal needs is a, is a big burden and duty of fathers, and it's something that is part of their state in life, and it's of the utmost importance because it's that state of life that was given to them by God himself. But even more important than those duties, which we cannot bypass, but even more important than those duties are the spiritual duties of a father. Too often, the father is busy with all of his work and, you know, in the world and kind of can be tempted to just pass things off and say, well, my wife will take care of, of that side of things. And that's, that's a horrible way of thinking in that regard because our spiritual duties as fathers are of the utmost importance. You oftentimes actually see that it's a, uh, in a stereotypical way, of course, amongst uh, you know, very, very Italian type of families. You know, the, the husband will go off and do his thing all day long all seven days of the week, and then the mother will be there hour after hour doing all sorts of random devotions in church and, you know, kneeling before a million different statues and making little offerings here and there. And the husband will say, well, my, my wife, she's, she's so pious, she prays for the both of us. And so I'm good, I'm covered under her prayers, and I don't have to do those of my own. It does not work that way, of course. In reality that spiritual care for the family falls first and foremost upon the shoulders of a father. And when we talk of fathers, I can't help but want to show you the unity between those of fathers of, of, of you all, those who are in care of families, and the example given to us by the ancient desert fathers, the, the desert fathers for those who don't know, were those, these men who lived a life basically almost as a hermit, leaving all of the world behind, leaving everything there, and going off into the wilderness, into the, what was known as the desert, just barren land, and living the most simplistic and detached life of prayer and penance that one can think of. And you're probably saying to me, you know, Father, how are you going to unite the duties of uh, actual, you know, parent to children and, and head of a family to that of those who forsake all of that, that left all of those things behind to go into the desert. How can that be united? It, does, it doesn't seem to be possible. But on the contrary, it is so possible. It, one of the, the great things of the Desert Fathers, and it's something that I learned um, more about during this past year's priestly retreat. It was on, actually, the Desert Fathers, and it's a great source of meditation. Uh, there was three main points that the Desert Fathers had for all of those who chose that way of life to be followed in order to gain sanctity. Those three points were fuge, tace, and quiesce. That is, to flee to be quiet, and to pray. And those three points are also so important for a father of a family to instill in all of those 
who are part of this family. The Fuji, the flea. How does that happen? The desert fathers fled the world to go out into the desert. They saw that the world was truly a source of great temptation to sin, a source of distraction, and they sought to get away from it all. And not just distraction and, and temptation to sin in ways that we think of off the top of our head, things like you know, temptation towards lust or to greed or towards, or towards uh, you know, gluttony, things like that, but even just distraction to falling into the ways of the world, those distractions causing things like rash judgment or caring more about what's going on with the people around us rather than looking upon ourselves. One story is of one of the great desert fathers, the abbot Moses, and he was highly regarded as, as one of these great spiritual fathers of the desert. And the abbot Moses was there, and whenever there was an issue that would raise up, the, the fathers of the desert would come together in some sort of small council, the ones that were in that area of land near each other. they come together in council, and they tried to pass some sort of judgment in regards to the issue at hand. And this one day in particular, there was a, a, one of the brothers that was one of the, 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 the living out in the desert. He had fallen into some sort of sin. And so they came together and convened in council. And they wanted to condemn this man, but they, didn't, but they needed the abbot Moses to do so. Because they regarded him as really the head of this area, the, the, most, the most spiritual and the most knowledgeable of them all, and so they were not going to condemn him without his, him present. So they sent one of the brothers to go get Abbot Moses, and he said, you're, you're called to counsel. And Abbot Moses said, ah, you know, go away from me, I'm, I'm here praying in my room. And so he sent the brother back, and the brother said, you will not come. And so they said, okay, well, let's send one of the priests to go get him. So they sent one of the fathers out to the Abbot Moses and told him, you needed a counsel, we need you there for the, this act of condemnation. He said, I do not want to go. And he said, but you have to. It's your duty as the abbot. And he said, fine, I will come. And so before he came, he filled up a wicker basket filled with sand. And he poked holes in the bottom of the basket. And he put it on like a backpack and carried it all the way to the council. And then he walked in to where the council meeting was held. And there he is carrying this great load of sand upon his back, and all of it's leaking out all over the place. It's going all over the floor, and it's getting their sandals dirty, and all of these things, and they're looking at him in a very strange way, like, what are you doing? And so they finally say, Heaven Moses, why are you making such a mess in here? You're, you're really just, what, what, are you, what is your purpose? And the Abbot Moses said, you, he said that, uh, that you called, you said, my sins fall out behind me like the sand from this basket, and I see them not. And yet you want me to condemn this man before us. And that thought is such a great point. Their focus was so much on what this young brother had done, his fault in whatever it was, that they had all forgotten about the, taking care of their own spiritual life, working on their own sins, because there were two busy with this worldly mentality of worrying about each other and failed to look at their own sins. And the brothers all realized what the abbot was saying. They, forgive, they forgave that brother of his fault and they all retired to their cells in solitude and prayer. And for fathers, that has to be that, that mentality. We have to focus on each of our own spiritual lives. We have to not worry or care about those around us, the faults of those we see in the world. We should not notice those things at all, really. We should try to be so steered away from them that we don't even notice. And, and rather, purely look upon working on our own spiritual life. And Father's instilling that idea, fleeing from the world, not only from, from its temptations to sin, but even from the distractions of pointing out faults in others, just completely leaving that world behind and focusing on our spiritual life, the fuji, the 
complete. And it's important to realize that this chief duty is done in solitude. Pace, be quiet. Fathers must ensure quiet and prayerful time in the house. Of course, it's not, you're not monks, you're not silent. That would be totally contrary to your state in life. You're supposed to have good times and good conversations and and laughs and, and things like that, and, you, you, and you're meant to be social. But you need those times, those periods in the day that are set aside so you can have quiet, so you can meditate on the things of God, so you can focus back upon your own spiritual life. The abbot Macarius told his brothers to flee. And the brothers looked at him and said, we live in a desert. How can we possibly flee any further away from the world in the desert? We are out here by ourselves. And the Arabic Marcarius held his finger to his lips and he said, fly from this. And he retired to his cell and closed the door in prayer and sacrifice. Saint Arsenius said that I have many times confessed the things I have said but I have never confessed when I have chosen to remain silent. A great lesson to us all, a great learning in what truly is the mother tongue of sanctity, that is, of silence. That we need those times to shut out all of the distractions of life, to refocus ourselves in that quiet. The quiet is something that speaks to us the truth, because that's where God lies in those times of prayer and solitude and setting a time, aside a time to not worry about anything else that we have around us, but just God in quiet. We need that every day. And lastly, creation, pray. And not just a prayer, but a prayer of the heart, a prayer of the love of God. Fathers have the duty to ensure spiritual duties are taken care of in their very families. And not just their daily prayers, but their daily prayers and attending the sacraments as often as possible and fostering a true love of God in their hearts. It's not good enough to come for Sunday Mass and to tell them to go to confession and to tell them to say their prayers. That's not good enough. That doesn't foster love. Of course, you need to do those things because kids need guidance and they need direction and they need rules and regulations. They need something to follow in order to stay on that straight and narrow path towards God. So don't stop doing those things, but you have to explain as well. Never pass up a teachable moment for the spiritual life. Never let an opportunity go by to foster not just verbal prayer, but love of God in the hearts of your children. Never pass up an opportunity to lead, not by word, but by example. If they see you do it, they will want to follow. If they see you act in accordance to the things that you say, they will fall in line with you. And if they understand why we pray, why we go to the sacraments, why we offer sacrifice, why we offer penance, why we fast, why we do extra for God, why we do all of these things, if they understand why and the reasoning for it and the giving nature of the spiritual life and the desire to please God above all else, not because we're afraid of him like he's some, some harsh judge that's going to throw lightning bolts down at us or quick to condemn us, not because he simply told us so, but because we love him and we want to love him more tomorrow and we want to love him more the next day and we want to love him for eternity in heaven. When they understand that, then their faith will not be one of mere words recited or mere actions done, but one of truly belief and living it in their lives. It's that quiesce, the, the, the prayer of the heart, that love of God that's absolutely necessary. An example that came to my attention recently was family that I had seen 
and they're very good about oftentimes coming to extra things. It's a large family. They had, you know, a number of children. And the, the kids will come along as well to all of these extra exercises, different daily masses, partaking in, in activities of the church, coming even to, to Vesper prayers or to extra devotions and things like that. And you would see them, and they come. And, you know, you just took it for granted that this is a good family, a pious family, that's trying to do their best to, 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 to save their souls. And you never thought really all that much more of it. Until just recently, I was talking with Father McGuire, and he said he was very edified when he talked to the father of that family, because the father had told them, told him that, obviously, when the, the duties... The, the kids have to go to. But the extras, he doesn't force them to go to. He encourages them to. But he's built up such a consistent habit with his own actions and his own words, and he's built up such a good foundation in spiritual life amongst his children and built up such a good fostering of love of God in their lives beyond all else that he simply gives them the option. I'm going to Mass today. You're welcome to come. And they come. I'm going to this devotion today. You're welcome to come. And they come. They follow. Not because they have to, because they want to. That has to be our goal as well. It has to be an action of their own will in the long run. Of course, we, like I said, we guide them to where they need to be. But we have to instill that love of God that makes them want to do it themselves because that's what's going to carry over when they move out and they're on their own, and their only answer to themselves to perform these duties. So, we, especially fathers, but all of us, we have to choose to make sure that we stay close to those sacraments, come as often as we can. We have to make sure that we receive them whenever it is possible, and when we can't receive them, we're united to those sacraments, at least spiritually, making good spiritual communion, making sure we do our daily act of contrition. We have to make sure that we seek that solace from the world that we need in order to foster our souls. We need to seek that union with God. We need to do as much as possible to love and to serve the triune God whom we celebrate today every single day of our life. Fathers, we have to lead by example and we have to realize that leading our family to heaven is our greatest duty of all. If nothing else happens well in your family life, other than the fact that you've been able to guide your children towards the love of God and towards salvation, then you've succeeded in every possible way that was important. If we do these things, then we'll see that our families are united to the triune God in this life and gives us great hope that we'll all be united with him in eternity in heaven. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.